Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, from Boston to Big Backbeats, award-winning drummer and educator, Jim Riley. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Rich Redman here. The Rich Redman Show, another exciting episode. We're coming to you live from Nippers Corner, America. So exciting. I'm really excited about today's show. What is the show about, Rich? Well, first of all, who are you? You are Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. You make this thing happen with your time and talent. You are the secret weapon. Thank you for always being here, buddy. Well, thank you for reminding me who I am because I forgot. (laughs) What do we talk about on this podcast? We talk to artists, thought leaders, Business leaders, comedians, actors, musicians, anybody in the creative arts. Yeah. A lot of those, you know. That's pretty much. And usually we talk about music motivation and success, those mm-hmm. three things. And it's usually just a quick hour, boom, when you're driving your car, it's still gonna you're going to learn something. Mm-hmm. and we're going to educate you, and, and we're going to entertain you. And we let the conversation just flow naturally. Maybe we do. give you a peek behind the curtain. Now, this is going to happen today, and this is kind of a very special day because this gentleman and I go way back. We moved to Nashville together. We didn't yeah. know we were moving here together. The one notable thing about this guest is is the fact that I think he slept on your, your minivan seats. He doesn't like talking about that, but I think it's a compelling story. <laughs> now this is a real rags to better rags tale yeah. and today we're joined by longtime drummer and band leader for rascal flats coming up on their 20th anniversary mr yeah. jim riley hey buddy hey bud how are you man it's a giant crowd i can't believe you fit all of those people it in is here. incredible man you try miking them i mean yeah. it's a nightmare this is fun jim this is i was so excited to have you as a guest because we have this history of educating ourselves at the university of north texas which is probably something we could talk about and we cut our teeth in the dallas fort worth scene playing all different kinds of music you went on to kansas city for a little while mm-hmm. i moved into dallas and we were like getting our ten thousand, our tens of thousands of hours together and then somehow in around february or march of 1997 we ended up in nashville tennessee yeah it's really bizarre that for as many years as we weren't around each other from the early 90s to the late 90s, how we ended up picking the same two weeks to uh, right. to show up. So uh, for those of you who don't know the story, I, I basically showed up to the uh, Club 16th Avenue Cafe, look over and there's Rich. And I'm yeah. like, man, how long have you been here? He says, I've been here like, you know, four days. It's like, how long have you been here? I've been here a week, you know. That's crazy. Um, is that the shoe store now or is it something else? Yeah, that's the shoe store. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember walking into that place when I first, uh, maybe a couple of days before I saw you. And and I saw these, these uh, people, you could tell they were all in the music business and they could tell they were all, you know, trying to to make it and i was like i don't know anybody in here i said i just want to make it a goal that you know i want to be able to walk in this place and know everybody yeah and uh i I think that uh from a networking perspective that was a really good attitude to have because uh there was a lot of people that i that i met at that time that are you know that are still in the business and that i've worked with and uh, that are still doing really well so it was a it was really fun time and you went down to lower broadway and you and i played all those window gigs so Mm -hmm. there's a there's this crazy new nashville where you know japanese tourists are coming in and all the woo woo girls are coming in for their bachelorette party but for the most part um people are going down and it's it's a unique place in the world because you can go to robert's western world tootsies layla's bluegrass in it and then the stage and then there's the other side of the street rippies and this is live Live music from 10 a.m. to 3 in the morning, 365 days a year. Talk about a gold mine for guys like you and I that wanted to go meet people and work on our craft. Well, it was a lot different when we got here. It was a lot smaller. You know, um, when when we got here, there was probably about 10 clubs to play, and you just named about five of them. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, now there's there's probably, uh, including the, uh, the namesake of the artist that you play with, there's probably about 30 clubs down there, and each of them have three uh stages so i mean you know there's probably there's probably at any given time there's probably 60 bands playing when there used to be about 10 so there's a lot of great opportunities for young players and not just young players uh, any players that are transplanting themselves i've always said it's a good idea to get down there because it, it's kind of a uh, a confluence between the um uh, 
the the local players, the session players, and the road players. Right. There's there's this little common area there, and even to this day, I mean, you find a lot of players that they just they're like us. They just love playing music. So even if they didn't need to be down there playing you know necessarily for their financial success they just want to be playing music and you're going to be able to meet people like that when you go down there and you know it's great to meet drummers but the the people that you really want to be able to meet are the guitar players and bass players and keyboard players and singers yeah that are um that are are going to be future players with artists and future artists themselves yeah they're the next rascal flats and jason aldean absolutely you're probably going to meet him down there so you and i both did that and it, at the time it was a different uh, economic bracket because we were playing for tips and a tip bucket and i think that's still kind of happening but literally sometimes i would pay ten dollars to park and i would have a ten dollar bar tab and i would make eight dollars so i was actually paying to play but that's okay because i actually paid to advertised my craft which was my skip my skills that's my product and i met all sorts of people relationships now Wait, is this stuff that you can learn at the school of rock um you know i the segue was going to be about relationships but that's a good one too sorry no because jim this is perfect because jim is a big believer in music education i think the gym is a product of music education yeah i'm a product of music education we're lucky because you studied music on the east coast in boston originally mm -hmm. then you go to this great texas music education culture i moved to el paso texas when i was 11 starting in the fifth grade band i started taking lessons and i was in the pep band and the concert band and the orchestra and the jazz band and tons of experience and that's the kind of thing that our friends angie and kelly mccright at school of rock school of rock nashville school of rock franklin they can provide that experience for your kids so if you have some parents if you have some kids out there and your kids want to learn how to be better singers they want to play in a rock band they want to learn how to slap at the bass learn some guitar chords they want to play their keyboards in a cool setting they want to learn how to play drums they can learn all those things at the school of rock from age 6 to 18 there's even an adult program they do tons of concerts around the middle tennessee area and it's a great way to not only learn a musical instrument but you also learn great life skills it improves your self-esteem and improve and improves your emotional intelligence and your literacy and your teamwork and learning about persistence and time management all these great things that kids can learn don't you think jim and, and positive self-esteem and confidence totally absolutely. it's a big thing music education yeah well i mean as an and as an educator i think uh, when i look at my students i think about the ones that have book smarts and the ones that have street smarts mm. And, you know, when you're taking lessons, you're, you're kind of developing your book smarts, but until you go out there and, and do it, you're, you're really not kind of developing any uh, street smarts. And when you, you go to a place like School of Rock, you're, you're really, you're getting in a situation where you're with other kids and you're making music and you have to solve a lot of the problems that even young professionals are still struggling to do that don't have that kind of experience. So I think it's great, you know, for if you're a teacher, to uh, recommend that in addition to studying with you, getting that instruction, that they go out there and use their experience in in, uh, in, in a group like School of Rock. Exactly, and and I think, what, what's the uh, the phrase that Angie always says? They, they don't teach music to play shows, they play shows to teach music. Learn by doing. I learn like by, it's I like def that. Definitely learn by doing. So if you're interested, uh, here's an email address, school, ah, Nashville at schoolofrock.com or franklin at schoolofrock.com so send an email to angie and kelly tell them rich sent you tell them said the two Jim sent you and it's a great thing schoolofrock.com they're getting some love in this episode oh, this segment is sponsored by nashville school of rock the nashville and franklin and you know the nashville have, school of rock yeah you should do the that's new, right new vo i did it on the end of the commercial that's right you did so it's a good so, thing you think he should do that so he already did that um <laughs> We're, we end up living together. Yeah. And we're over off of Edmondson Pike, which is so hilarious because we moved here about 23, 24 years ago. And it took me 23 years to buy a house right up the street. When I was driving here, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was thinking about driving by Nipper's Corner and, you know, movie theater. And I'm going, wow, this is literally where it all started. Brandywine Rain Tree Apartments yeah. is where we lived, mm -hmm. and I was, you were, you were right away were somehow making a living. You were shaking hands, and you were playing all sorts of shifts. Well, part of that was due to you know you talked about me going to Kansas City, yeah, and uh, I think the thing that was interesting about that was uh, one of the phone calls I got. I was working at a drum shop up there, and uh, a random phone call came in, and they said, "Hey, they need someone to play over at this." Uh, 
this dive bar, country bar, and they literally asked everybody at the shop, and there were four other guys working there, and they all said no. And then they, they said, well, let's see if Jim wants yeah. to do it. And I'm like, is it a gig? Yeah. Does it pay something? Sure. Yeah. I'll be there. Uh, and it paid 50 bucks a night. And uh, the thing for me was it was all traditional country music. It was an older band. It was all guys, you know. 50s the lead singer was in his 70s steel player was probably in his 70s yeah yeah you know it's like so it was it was a band where i was going to learn a lot of the history of country music so i mean it was all music from you know the 60s and 70s and the really the, the latest stuff they were playing was like george Strait. so i was getting a huge country music education and they were getting uh a, a drummer you know that had you know good skills and so it was a really a win-win for everybody i did that gig for two years and uh, actually halfway in between the band kind of turned over and it was only me the lead singer that stayed so i ended up getting a whole nother batch of songs so when i came to nashville to explain what you you know what you saw and experienced i don't think it was so much oh wow jim's such a great drummer that's why he's getting so acclimated so fast for me i think it was they went wow this guy he doesn't look at all like he knows this stuff but yeah, he you, really knows this you had stuff. hair to the middle of your back exactly yeah. so <laughs> they they i think they they could they could sense that i had studied the music i knew the chord changes i could sing some songs i could sing some harmonies and so that helped me get um integrated in with the local system fast now i was working at that drum shop uh the boomtown, boomtown percussion boomtown percussion what is it now is it like a five-star restaurant or something no it's actually completely gone they, they raised that building completely it's uh a parking lot it's kind of a parking lot yeah. now, right right where that was but uh when that place shut down uh i didn't have any place to live and you know i had the the dog and i had the truck and it was like a classic country song you dog know? and a truck it was a dog and a truck and i had and, a cat and a minivan and I'm broke exactly yeah. yours doesn't sound as good in a country song <laughs> minivans no the cat and a minivan but, yeah so i um so I, I just took to living in in my truck for a couple of weeks and i was actually parked out behind 16th avenue cafe That's because it's like jewel yeah, because it was a well lit parking lot right there, and you know if anyone uh, came to the window, which they never did, I'm sure the dog would, woo, 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 you know, and that would have been the end of that. Yeah. Uh, but then I got a call on my uh, my beeper number from you saying that you were going out of town for a couple weeks. It was like weeks. two four seven drum or something like that, right? What your beeper? No, no, no. My 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 regular number is a drum number. Is it that still one. right now? Yeah, my okay. Oh, yeah, we'll yeah. tell the masses. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, you just you can guess. You can guess on the. You have what a thousand choices yeah, on much. on the three six one five and there's a three seven eight six. You, I'll let you guys guess. The <laughs> yeah. first one to call me uh, gets free drum lesson. That's right. Text uh, Jim yeah, in the yeah, middle of the and, night, and it's going <laughs> to convince me to change my number. Yeah, exactly. I've had, I had it for twenty years, for and you ruined it. Uh, <laughs> I had a drum number for a while, yeah. but then I. For, right around the BlackBerry period when I was meeting all sorts of people when we were doing 200 shows a year, I was meeting some interesting people. And then as like when I got married, I would be getting these strange texts in the middle of the night. I said, I got to change my number. Yeah. Should have kept it. Yeah. Did you ever try to get Redmond as a number? It would have fit. Interesting. Never no. thought of it, huh? No, thank you. I, I, I just thought wonder of it. if the, the local prefixes would even. I mean, these days yeah. it doesn't make as much of a difference as, no. it, as it used to. Just dial Redmond. I remember when all the Angelinos were moving here 15 years ago. They're like, oh my God, I got to change my 818 or my 310 to 615 so people take me seriously. And I even remember some friends of ours, oh, we could talk about them after, but they're Italian and they have really intense Italian last names and they shorten their names or change their names because they're like, I want to play the game with the good old boys and I don't think they're going to want that, that around. It's just that kind of thinking now it just blows my mind because right. we're such a melting pot now yeah 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 i mean the, the the thing that i really love about this town is um if you if you love this music and you have a desire to play great music with great musicians and you're willing to put in the work and you do the study of the material sure anybody you know, I mean, uh, anybody, it doesn't matter whether you're black or white or any other color, or especially uh, a person that I'm extremely proud of right now. Keo. Miss, Miss, <laughs> nah, I'm not, I, I just spent the weekend with him. Yeah. Uh, Miss, Miss Janae Fleener. Um, Janae Fleener just won uh, female 
Uh, she she won CMA Musician of the Year, not Female Musician of the Year. She is the first female to win CMA Musician she a player? of the Year. Yes. Wow. Yes. Does she play in your band that you placed on town? Or I- no, 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 no. Uh, Janae and I. Um, well, Janae and I met on uh, Rascal Flat Sessions. She was playing on some. Uh, some flat sessions and then we did some uh, sessions over at Jay's together and uh, we have a um, we have a, a, a mutual client uh, we have two mutual clients actually yeah. uh, and as a matter of fact the night of the CMAs when she was winning uh, CMA musician of the year this is great uh, I was playing a gig with Brent Mason that she is normally on but she couldn't be there because yeah. she was uh, at CMAs winning uh, musician of the year so and because and, and, it's usually a, a guitar player it usually is, and, and and for all of history, it has been a man. So uh, mm. it, it's it's great to see uh, that uh, there are people kind of breaking down uh, borders, even in 2019. I love that, and uh, I'm sure everybody wants to. You know, for me, as far as the material, you know, you and I were city slickers, and you know, we were raised on playing classical music and big band music and fusion and stuff. And so you got this crash course education in Kansas City that kind of like mm. led the way when I moved here the first thing I did on the second day that I moved here was I went to this place called The Great Escape which is now a pizza shop it's Two Boots Pizza right there on kind of like 19th and Division area right over there and uh, I bought everyone's greatest hits on cassettes so I mm-hmm. bought Tammy Wynette's greatest hits and George Jones' greatest hits and I was like oh stick in a brush no, I remember you had, a, you had all that stuff at, the, uh, at the apartment crash course you know in, 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 in the music and kind of just respecting it as a genre and learning things on the bandstand. And so I'm so glad we did it. And and then by sticking around long enough for over 20 years, we were actually able to help change the sound of country music. So I just, if you're in the game long enough, great things are going to happen. Well, I'm, and imagine how easy it is now as a person coming to town to do the research. You know, I mean, you have any number of uh, yeah. music uh you know, I've, I've got Apple Music, so I mean, I've got, you know, a billion records and, and, and pretty much the history of country music or any other music. Spotify, I mean, $10 um, a month, all the world's music, whoa. Yeah, it's 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 pretty amazing considering, you know, when we were in college, we would have to go to uh, to the library to, to listen to our tunes, and now we've got everything uh, sitting on our phone. It's it, There's no excuse, kids. You put your playlist together and get practicing. You think that's taken for granted, though? I think so. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I take it for granted. And no, I mean, do you see it from students and stuff? Like yeah, that? but I but I'm saying even I take it for granted that I've yeah. got everything there. But uh, definitely, I I try to use it more in their presence as mm-hmm. an example when I'm going. You know, here's an example of exactly what I'm talking about. Especially, you know, I've got students that are trying to study jazz, and I'm like, you know, if you want to study jazz, you've got to listen to jazz. I mean, you can learn the uh, you can learn the, the language, yeah. but but until you kind of like hear it in action, you're not really going to get what the conversation feels like. Yeah. Right. And I think we have, a, we definitely have a lot to talk to you about being an educator because you've really blossomed in that area over the years because you've focused on that. But I met a young Jason Aldean in 1999. So people are like, how long have you been playing with Jason? I said, 20 years. They're like, I didn't know if he was around that long. Oh, he was around. You just didn't really hear about us until maybe like 15 or 16 years ago. And we did three or four tours together with us opening up for you. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people are interested how you take being new in a city like Nashville and you end up being the drummer in a mega band. How did you meet those guys? Well, you talked earlier about, you know, playing on uh, Lower Broadway. The very first gig that I landed uh, of, you know, significance was uh, playing with with Mark Chestnut. And I I got that gig playing at uh, Legends Corner right there uh, across from the the arena. And I played with Mark for two years. In 1999, we had, we were on a tour called the Crown Royal Tour. We had Gary Allen opening up for us. Um, we had uh, Shelly Wright opening up for yeah. us. And in Shelly's band was Jay DeMarcus and Joe Don Rooney. That's right. Now, I already knew those guys because uh, I'd known Jay probably since 98. Uh, we were playing in the club. So we were we were working at the Fiddle and Steel a lot. Is that still there? It is not. What is it now? It is a boutique hotel. Wow. Oh yeah, my I God. actually, I actually have a uh, about a four by four uh, piece of the bar at my my house. They actually cut the entire bar up and they gave it to people. That's really oh, smart. Wow. Yeah. So, and, is, and, is and the I, brass table still there? And the no, all of that's gone. You, the blues bar is still there. 
the blues bar is there, but everything to the left of the blues bar is gone. Wow. Um, that Yeah, all of that stuff's gone. So the karaoke place next to it is gone. And then there was Barbara's, who you, we cut our teeth in. Yeah, well. yeah. And, and and so between Barbara's, which is where I met Jay, and then the, the fiddle, which is where we, we gigged a lot, yeah. um, we were playing, you know, $40 gigs over there. Um, there was some friends of ours, uh, of ours, that uh, Blue Healers, that were playing on Monday nights, and we kind of, we both of us would sub for them. Both of us would sit in with them. And then, uh, Jay really Jay Carey and Jodon started playing, uh, as deuces wild in, um, 1999 at the fiddle. And I was one of the two drummers that they, they used a lot. Of course, the other one was Preston Stanfield Preston. who played with Shelly Wright. Who moved to Florida, right? He is in Florida now and he's doing great. great. I've seen him recently. So yeah, between my relationship playing with them, uh, in town and then, the relationship we had where we were touring uh, and they were seeing me with the headliner. Um, when they got their, their record deal, they, uh, they asked me if I would uh, come out with them. And, you know, of course I had a great gig with Mark. I mean, Mark's got over a dozen number one hits. I mean, you know, he had this amazing era in the mid nineties that I'd kind of missed. So I was there kind of after that now. And in, in my mind, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great to just be able to take that ride with somebody. I mean, you know, I mean, that would be awesome, but, you know, who knows if that'll ever happen. And so cut to when the, the guys asked me if I want to come out with them, I said, you know, I really I want to hear the music. I said, oh, you know, because honestly, I know people that are very talented, and then you hear the the, the music and you go, boy, they're really missing the mark here, you know? So um, <laughs> we just had Lonnie sitting right there a couple of days ago and he played on that first record. Absolutely. Right? So, um, so when... When I heard the music, the first, which was the first four songs, which was like, you know, Praying for Daylight and Everyday Love, which were their first two singles and two other songs that were great. Um, I, I just, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how fresh it was. It was about the that murder and music row time where people were really kind of going, you know, is it which way is music going to go? Is it going to turn towards where Brad Paisley's heading, or is it going to turn where these other whippersnappers like Rascal Flats and Keith Urban are, are are heading? And the truth is, is it did both. Yeah, mm -hmm. it did both, yeah. and and the genre just widened out uh, and has become the really truly universally accessible genre that it has become because you know you took like the really super country thing that paisley was doing the super pop thing that rascal flats was doing and then the super kind of hard rock thing that that aldine yeah w was doing that kind of paved the way for a bunch of those kind of artists and all of that talking about you know drinking from the same trough i mean you know it's the the common thread of country music is it's always about the songs the lyrics are held to a higher standard you know when we think about rock and roll we think about like uh, led zeppelin we're going dun, 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 dun. it's the riff God, dun, 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 dun. and then you know he starts singing and we don't know what the heck he's talking about and we don't really care it sounds awesome it just sounded mm -hmm. awesome we just yeah. love the way it makes us feel sure yeah. and that's what rock and roll is about. Rock and roll is about the way it makes you feel. But but country music is all about the stories. And that's the thing that <laughs> kind of takes all of that stuff and puts it into the same genre. And it's it's an amazing genre to be a part of even now in 2019. You're right, because it's that one genre that appeals to male and female 15 to 50, which is near impossible yeah. to achieve. In it, your band achieved it. My boss achieved it. Is there funny? There's a funny meme going around the internet that says subjects that Led Zeppelin said, sang about, and there was just like 80% citrus because squeeze the lemon, let the juice run down my leg. They were always talking about citrus, which was basically sex. And then the other 20% was talking about elves, dwarves, and Middle Earth and J.R.R. <laughs> Tolkien. But yeah. we didn't care because the riffs were so incredible. I, I didn't know any of that stuff like, because I'm, I'm not Rush, listening to it from Rush, that way. Pretty much Rush was Rush. Also, also about dwarves and ants and fantasy lands pretty much Cra yeah. crazy yeah. geek rock geek yeah. rock but Math hey fans. you know it's uh when you say drummer people immediately think of phil collins Stuart copeland and neil Peart. Mm -hmm. it's so hard to get you it's so hard to get roped into that category it's near impossible and to qualify what jim had said before about the uh, not understanding or hearing the lyrics in the rock songs yeah remember when rock band came out and people were starting to dissect and isolate the tracks from all these classic <laughs> rock songs. One, of, I know. Sorry, it's got to. I got to get some more oil for this. Okay, but the uh, "Running with the Devil" 
was isolated and you could really hear Roth's vocals and how like the timber of them was like multifaceted. It had such depth to it. But we also heard what he was really saying when he's like, God damn it, I ain't lying to you. We're going to hit you one more time. <laughs> you know, in the song, you have no idea what the hell he's saying. Yeah, it just felt good. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's what he's saying. Yeah, but there's an entire industry here of people respecting this tradition of at 10 a.m. on a Monday morning talking about love and loss and heartache. And then Dennis, then as I feel like the idiom got a little bit more homogenized in big business, it became like, okay, what liquor brand are we talking about? And then there's a bonfire and there's Daisy Dukes and then there's a party and how can we tell this story? Because I wrote songs for five years. I had a publishing deal. It was great to see that kind of things, but it was so difficult to try to come up with <coughs> to frame the 12 notes that we have in existence into the proper order that a soccer mom will remember like an earwig <laughs> while talking about Daisy Dukes, cinnamon whiskey, and a bonfire. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm I'm very much like a write-on-demand person. If if I've got a reason to write, um, I can write. Yeah. And, uh, oh, you're one musical dude. You're a great timpanist. I remember you guys, I remember yeah. you playing melodies on timpani yeah yeah you know it was, it was funny being at at the percussive art society convention that we were at you know so many of the people that i would that i went to school with a lot of them you know the grad students are all you know they've, they're all they were getting their masters or their doctorate then and they all teach it at, at uh, universities around the country so for for me it's definitely like going to a uh, uh it's like a, a class reunion it is a class reunion. and uh some of those guys, one of which is uh, is Eric Eric Johnson, who uh, founded uh, Innovative uh, Percussion, right? Who's right here in Nashville? Yeah, who's who's a businessman? You could definitely uh, nice talk to sometimes. Yeah, I would love he's, to have those guys over there. Yeah, you know, it's 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 interesting. You know, Nashville's become a real uh, mecca for some of that stuff. You know, the the guy who's uh, who's uh, at the top of Ludwig right now is is here in Nashville. But you know, you, of course, you got Meinl and you've got uh, Pearl and you've got Mapex uh, too, right? Mapex and and within pa Mapex, I think there's maybe Sonar is the distribution. It's in that brand now, KHS. You know, yeah, so there's there's a lot of uh, Pearl. Uh, yeah, there's mm -hmm. yeah there's a lot of that stuff. I mentioned it, but you oh, had to mention sorry. it again. Yeah, no, I just yeah, yeah. I just wow. No, you actually you don't have to mention it again. You know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think right before I signed with Promark, there was like, I was kind of always looking around and the guys from Innovative were like, oh, we'll bring you a box of all these killer products and we'll come by your uh, uh, your session at Omni. And they came by with like mallets and double-headed things and every kind of plastic wire brush thing. I was like, this is really fantastic. And, you know, usually what comes down to everything is relationships. And I... I and, and for me, that's the, it was totally the opposite because for me with Eric, I mean, he's somebody that I've known... Uh, it's one of the few people in this town that I've known longer than I've, I've known you. Yeah. I met him uh, probably in 1988 or 1989, and he was a grad student there, and he was wrapping mallets for people back then. And I met you in 1993. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, man. It's incredible. We're it, still living, baby. <laughs> we're still in this in business. We're not only surviving, we're thriving. It's incredible. And you're putting... You got you got a mouse to feed, man. I've been to the house that drums built. Yeah, and you got a family. I do. You're making it happen, man. Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, been very happy, happily married now for a long time. I've got uh, three kids. Yeah, and mm. one of them is actually uh, studying drums with me right now. What? Nice. He's actually listening to his dad. She. Oh, sorry. His also. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My my oldest daughter. What? Um, she she seemed like. I mean, I put her behind drums when she was in kindergarten. Yeah. She was like, yeah. go do, go do. she could do it, yeah. you know, but she didn't have a lot of interest. And, and, and when they're young, I don't really have any interest in pushing them to it. Right. But um, it, it got, you know, she got to sixth grade and um, all of a sudden she said, I, I want to be in your class. I went, really? She said, yeah. I said, okay. All right. Well, and so it was funny. Uh, you know, uh, my wife had a talk with her and said, "You know, you, you gotta you gotta behave like one of the students. You can't behave like your you know your your daddy's little girl in there. You can't be mouthing off and doing you know the stuff that you you do upstairs. You know, uh, <laughs> and just being sassy. You know, so she's been she's been great. Uh, it's 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 been very interesting. Uh, you know, teaching her. She's actually I give her a lot of credit because I'm not changing what I'm doing, and she is." Uh, very accepting of that. So she's doing a good job. That's yeah. amazing. Oh, that is she, fun. I she's, love talking She's 11. About this. 11 years old. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, yeah so I've been in that house uh, since I think it was uh, 2000, 
2007 or eight. And when, when I built the house, uh, I was definitely uh, trying to build it around the idea of that basement mm-hmm. being my, you know, being my future drum, drum dojo. You yeah, know? drum dojo. Yeah, so. Uh, I like that. Hold that thought, Jim, because we got to pay some bills. We're going to be right back. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Learn by doing, I definitely think, resonates with what we're about here at the School of Rock. I'm Angie McCright, and I'm the owner of the School of Rock in Franklin and Nashville. I would say that the majority of kids that come in have either been sitting in their bedrooms, watching YouTube, learning how to play, or they've taken music lessons at some point in their life. We do have a lot of beginners. It doesn't matter what level you're at. You can participate in our programs, whether you're a beginner or you're advanced. We don't teach music to put on shows. We put on shows to teach music. Connect with School of Rock today. Search School of Rock Franklin or Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. And bills paid. All right, so we're back. We were talking about the drum dojo. That was exhausting, by the way, yeah. paying all those bills. <laughs> so I didn't know I was going to have to be an active part of that. Licking but, stamps. Well, you'll have to watch it all on the, uh, the what are they, the, the, the bonus features? Yes. The bonus. Yeah, yeah. Behind the scenes. Yeah. So I know I wanted to talk about the, uh, the drum dojo, but Jim was very interested in hearing you finish up your story about your gut feeling hearing the Flats music for the first time. Yeah, well, I mean... <laughs> And you've been through the exact same thing, so you know. And I don't think anybody can predict what's going to happen in the music business any more than anyone can predict what's going to happen in the stock market. Right. But you and I end up coming off looking very smart because the one thing we have in common with our stories is we both had a choice as to who we were going to hitch our wagon to. Mm-hmm. You know, you kind of doing all sorts of uh, little little demo projects and custom projects for people. Showcases. I mean, Aldean was just one of a two dozen people in a couple of years span that you were doing that with. But you said, no, that's the one. That's the one. Yeah. And for me, uh, I already had a great job uh, that, that was secure. And certainly, I mean, to this day, those guys are still working with Mark Chestnut. So why leave a, a really established gig to go do something that uh, really is completely unproven and could, I mean, let's face it. I mean, this the first single failed miserably. They might not have made it through the summer. Could have tanked. Mm, you know, it could have completely tanked. So I heard the music. I just thought it was really, really fresh. Um, I believed in these guys, as I still do. And uh, they believed in me. And when yes. Jay hired me uh, uh, on behalf of, of the, other, the other two, you know, he told me that his intention was, he said, listen, I want you to be with us for our entire career. And I said, well, I want to be with you for your entire career. That's good. And, career uh, and I, and I, yeah. So, I mean, I remember us going and playing our very first gig and you'll appreciate this. I don't think you've ever heard this. We were opening up for Terry Clark at a club in St. Louis. Wow. So we're going to our very first gig. Um, one of the, the guys, uh, managers, actually went along and knew Terry because he had once worked for Brooks and Dunn and she'd opened up for them. So they had a relationship. And so he said, Hey, I got this new band and they're opening up for you. They have never played a live gig together. Just, if we can just get them a little bit of time for sound check, you know, that would be great. And uh, she's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. And, um, so then, she proceeds to rehearse her band, rehearse her band, rehearse her band until it's time for doors. And then um, they they pack up and then like doors open and that's when it's time for us to sound check. And, in front uh, of the open crowd. In front of the open crowd. Yeah. And, and I was fine because I didn't really know that much better than that. And I, I remember um, the, uh, Doug, their manager, was talking to Terry Clark later and um said uh so what am, is this going to be one of these bands i'm going to be opening up for in a couple of years and he says i promise you'll never be opening up for them wow <laughs> but, so they were posturing in a way it's, a you a know way. i don't know if it was totally on purpose but you know it was just wow. kind of funny because it was it, we were just so new and um i think when the flats came out of the gate i don't think people 
really, really knew what to expect with these guys. You know, I think we were coming off of like, you know, this boy band era in the late nineties and, Mm -hmm. you know, you see their first video and it is very shiny, you know, and you go, are these guys going to just be another boy band? And then you, you, you see them live and like they're, they're, the musicianship is phenomenal. They, they, they bring it vocally just like they do on the records. They're, they're phenomenal. And, um, the, like I said, the level of musicianship in the show, I think was a lot more, than people initially expected it to be. So it was a lot of fun that first summer, just kind of going out there, kicking ass and yeah. taking names. Here we are. And mm-hmm. I remember playing that first show and talking to Joe Don. He said, man, imagine what it's going to be like, man, after we've done 40 shows. After we've done 400 shows, you know, and now we're, <laughs> now you know, like oh, now we're over a thousand, you know. Yeah. Um, what was the first single, just out of curiosity? Praying for Daylight. Yeah. And that was a flop? No, 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 no. I said, if it was a flop. Oh, if it was a flop. No, okay. it, it did very well. I said, if it was a flop, I mean, that, that could have been the that could have been the end yeah. Yeah. of yeah. the whole run. Yeah. But uh, no, that song did very, very well. It was, it was either a number one. It was number one on some charts. It was, it was a very high single. Yeah. Their first couple of singles uh, did extremely well. Um, and then, uh, you know, they, they, they kept doing extremely well and then you know once once uh the uh the, the cars soundtrack the life's a highway thing um you that, know, that that kind of really blew them up and that was happening at the same time as uh the me and my gang record and once that those two things happened in 2006 everything just went crazy and then yeah. they were that's when they just hit a series and you know you guys have been through this obviously that just that series of can't miss you know multi-week number ones you know that are the type of thing that you have to have to cement you know a super career like what sure. they've, that what they've had so it's uh it, it for me it's been really gratifying to be able to like take that whole ride with them and now we're 20 years into it and i just i've never really seen anyone who has i mean can i say shit oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. I mean, they really give a shit, man. I mean, they really care. Yeah. They don't mail in any aspect of uh they don't mail in any aspect of it. So like when we put together a show for the last 20 years, we we take the whole show and we trash it and we start fresh. From fresh i really time. like that that's and, nice. And you know, so I mean, whether it's the physical set that we're on, whether it's the video panel setup that we've got whether it's the drum set that i've got i mean we're constantly you've had 20 different drum sets we've constantly evolved it um and 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 it helps that helps me uh creatively it helps me change my uh my approach to the music i play differently on a four-piece kit than i do on a 10-piece kit you know double bass monster and you know speaking of relationships you took a friend along with you for the ride craig as your drum tech yeah he's been there what the He's, whole time? No, he well, he he got there as fast as he could. It was two thousand six. So yeah, Craig Krulicki. Yeah. Krulicki. Um, great cat and because I, yeah. I remember playing well, and Maggie he, McGee's and he's, downtown he's another guy that came to town at, at, at pretty much the same time, uh, time period that uh, that we did. And so the funny story with Craig is real quick is when we we were down at Barbara's and it was you know probably you know November. Of uh, or dis- early December of uh, 1997, when we moved to town, he walks up to me. He says, "Hey, he says, um, do you have any microphones?" I said, "Yeah, I've got. I mean, I don't have a ton, but I've got. I've got some. I've got some 57s, and yeah. you know, I've got a couple other things." And he said, "I've got a New Year's gig. I need microphones. I don't have any." I said, "Well, I don't have a New Year's gig, and uh, I don't need those microphones right now. So if you want to borrow them, you can borrow them." So he borrowed him, did his gig, you know, week passes, hadn't heard anything from him. <laughs> a couple weeks pass, hadn't heard anything from him. See him cross the room over at Barbara's or something, you know. We don't really ever connect on him like that son of a gun. What does he, he's got my darn microphones, right? So I kind of had this thing in the back of my mind like, Don Kurlicki's got my microphones, man. I mean, for years now. So now at, at this point, it, it's become years. Now in 2005, um, I had a guy named uh, Jimmy Clark, not the fiddle player Jimmy Clark, but the drummer Jimmy Clark that yeah. was my uh, my drum tech. 
Uh, he's now the the drum tech for Lars on Metallica. That's right. Uh, but he was my first drum tech in 2005. Well, he left in 2005. We had an opening. Um, one of Craig's uh, friends was our production manager and asked him, I said, he said, do you have any interest in uh, maybe coming out and drum teching for Rascal Flatts? Which, again, it's 2006. Rascal Flatts is huge, you know. And he goes, no, you know, I've never once ever considered being a drum tech. Uh, he says, but I'm thinking about it now. Uh, and, he, and he said, well, what do you think? He said, well, uh, I've got two auditions coming up. I know uh, uh, one of them was uh, a guy that uh, Tom Drennan was uh, playing with there. Big, tall guy. Yeah. Yeah. That guy. Yeah, that guy. Um, and he says, if I, uh, if, if I don't get the gig, either one of these gigs, then I will, I will take the gig. And so that's, uh, that's what happened. Now, the, the, he, so once he agreed he was going to take the gig, he said, okay, well, you need to just go talk to our, uh, our road manager, just do a little interview, just so. It's just not just me hiring my buddy. We're going to you know, run it through some other channels, uh, but it's no problem. So just go see uh, our uh, road manager. So the road manager calls me in advance, and he says, uh, so, hey, do you have any problem with uh, Craig Krulicki coming out as your uh, drum tech? I said, no, not really. I mean, Craig's a, a, a nice guy, but. I'll tell you what, um, tell him if he wants the job, tell him to bring me my microphones. <laughs> totally. So, so Come back we, around to it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so he, um, he did indeed uh, ask him. He said, hey, so Jim said uh, you, you can have the gig, but uh, you need to bring him his microphones. And uh, the very next morning in a box were those microphones uh, <laughs> on, uh, on his desk. Finally. And uh, I was like, hey, and I still have those microphones. So I'm using one of them right now in my home studio. That's a great, <laughs> hey, great story. Yeah, great. That story. segment brought to you by Sure SM57. Yeah, right. so yeah, so mm -hmm. Craig's been with me since uh, 2006, and he really had to, he really had to learn the gig because he didn't mm -hmm. know he didn't know a lot about being a drum tech. And the first thing that we did was was bring him out on that you know massive 2006 tour. I had a, you know, a seven piece, uh, a seven or eight piece uh, double bass kit, and then Jay had another kit. And I mean, my kid had a gong and was on this big complicated rack and everything was brand new. So he came over to my house, the old house uh, in uh, East Nashville. And I had like seven and a half foot ceilings in, in the basement. And mm. just all of those <laughs> pipes, everything was just hitting the ceiling oh, at yeah. that point, you know, like just trying to, and it just looked like, because everything was brand new, just like that wrap, that brown wrapping paper that everything comes in, yeah. it just looked like a bomb had exploded with that brown paper. In and the first thing he had to do was come over and label every piece of both racks oh, and and learn and learn that whole thing. And then uh, he went through an interesting process of just learning how to tune. Where the first thing he did was have me uh, tune my drums. And then he went and harmonically analyzed everything that I did. Wow. And then he wrote down all of those numbers, and then he just tunes to those numbers, and that's how he does it. That's wow. smart. Now, yeah. what are you talking about harmonic analyzation? Like, a, like, a, like one of those really so, so, strobe tuners? So frequency? there's a lot of people like, you know, like DW's really big on like, you know, well, this, this uh, Pitch. shell is like an A flat or whatever. I don't really, you know, totally buy all of that because I think once you add stuff to the shell, you're adding mass to it, you're changing the pitch. But, um, but I, but what we do is, um, is I would tune, I would tune the drum. And then if you, if you put the drum down on a carpet or something where you're isolating the bottom head from, you know, you got the top head singing all by itself. And then you listen to the harmonic, you can listen to what pitch that is and if you match that pitch and then you turn it over and you match that pitch which for us is a half step lower then you're getting the same exact tuning every single time and for us that's really crucial because we haven't done sound checks for like 10 years spragger yeah so <laughs> it's great and to, to, to bring up a, a, a I would love to not a do quote from checks. step brothers <laughs> A quote from Step Brothers. It leaves us so much more time for activities. Activities. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, so, no, I, I I, would kill to not have Yeah, that. yeah. So we haven't done sound checks for like 10 years, but the only way that works is they, they do what's called the virtual sound check. So they'll have the board and they'll run all of the same, they'll run last night's show, show through all of the same channels. But the only way that works is if you're using the same mics on the same drum in the same proximity and the same tuning same, yeah. so that 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 ends up being uh, really, i love that well really you know important. my my drum tech speaking of relationships john hall we have been friends now facebook reminded me today we've been friends for eight years but we met 
at the Progressive was it, Arts it, was Society. It your, it's your friend anniversary today? It's our friend anniversary. It is mine and Travis Toy's friend anniversary oh, yeah. today. Travis Toy, I'll give a pitch uh, to my friend Travis Toy. He's uh, our steel guitar player with Rascal Flats. He's been there for a long, long, long time. And he actually has a new album coming out uh, of all of uh, his of all original music he's playing bass guitar uh drums uh steel you name it he's that guy he's that guy i haven't seen him in a long yeah, time yeah he's he's phenomenal phenomenal musician and uh travis toy's new uh album I is, love that. Uh, it's called entry point and it's coming out uh on black friday I love that. I, I haven't, yeah. So John and I have been working together for nine years and he's the kind of drum tech that literally it's set it and forget it. I could walk up to the stage, no problem ever without a sound check and have no problem whatsoever. But you don't get that opportunity. No, Tully likes to, uh, <laughs> you like sound check. Tully likes to sound check. Yeah, I get it. I get it. You know, I liked to sound check. What was happening was remember back in the day when we would be doing a lot of drum clinics, um, and Travis, this was Travis's fault in a sense. Uh, I was, I, I had a drum clinic that was about a half hour away. I rushed back to play the uh, sound check. The, the sound check, and uh, sound check was canceled. I said, "Who, who, who the heck canceled sound check?" And they, and they said, "Demarcus canceled it." Your boss. I'm like, oh, "Golly, man!" And uh, Travis put him up to it. He was just messing with me. You mm -hmm. know, he figured, you know, I'd, I'd go work really hard. So, I, so that happened a couple of times. They messed with me. So finally, I said, "Okay." No sound checks. But the, the, the interesting thing for us... Well, you can make that call because you're the band leader. Well, yeah. But, but you know, of course, I have bosses. And yeah. if they want to say, you know, you're going to sound check for two hours every day, I would sound check for two hours every day. Like 40, three but hours. I, but I think what, um, what came out of it was um, what we found was on the nights that we weren't sound checking, we were really fresh musically. Like, I mean, this was like our first moment getting up to the instrument and like it just felt really fresh it felt really uh sharp really sharp and we yeah. we loved it and so it, it became part of uh what we were doing now we rehearse when we need to rehearse but we don't you know just sound check for sound check's sake because thank god we've got we've got really an amazing crew and particularly our our, our techs the guitar techs bass techs drum techs keyboard techs are just phenomenal and uh, and world class and, and and so we're really lucky to have them, and that way uh, you know we're able to, to to not do sound checks and have you know complete confidence that everything's going to be awesome. Yeah, you know I just you know I I, mean, I squeeze stuff in man when that when that bus pulls up between six and nine a.m. I get up and then I go to the drum shop or the high school or the college or the corporate event and I get my butt back there by three thirty. What do you got on here? What the do you next got? thing we're going to talk about is your educational material song charting made easy in the survival guide for the modern drummer yeah nicely priced 19.99 and 24.95 they're changing lives they're part of the library of most smart drum educators and they're actually becoming the part of part of high school and college music curriculums well i i you know i again we just came back from uh, the percussive art society convention uh which is really great. I mean, if you're if you're a drummer in 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 America, there's literally no other drum festivals. Now, Drumio is going to be doing one coming up. That's in Canada, and that's a great opportunity. Good to know, yeah. Uh, but the uh, the one here, the Percussive Art Society. I mean, there's there's you know uh, like fifteen or sixteen clinics going on over the weekend, so it's it's really great. That so was fun. I love doing that and just hanging out. But as I walk the halls and in this is funny, and I know you, that you, this is the same way with you. I, I think, it, you know, as of today, right now, neither one of us are what I would categorize as famous, mm -hmm. right? But when we go to PAS or we go somewhere where we hit NAM or drum type stuff, we're yeah. sort of like drum famous. Yeah. You know, so like people are stopping me in the hallways yes. uh, the whole time. And, and of course, you know, it's like, it's like, Jim, you only have to be famous for three days. I think you can handle but it. You, 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 um, but I, I'm amazed at how many people, I mean, love the books. They, it's, it's crazy how much success the survival guide for the modern drummer book has had and how much like people are using it in universities and using it in their private lessons and using it just for self-improvement as a drummer um, in the darkest moments of when I was creating that book. And I say there were dark moments just because financially it cost a lot of money to do things in a way that I was doing it. I wanted to have 
world-class musicians specific to their genre. So when I was playing blues, I was using great blues players. When I was playing jazz, I was playing great jazz players, great country players, great metal players. When when I was, it was very genre specific. It's 124 tracks. So just think about that, like making like 10 to 12 solo records. And paying all the musicians. And paying all the musicians and paying an engineer. And, the mixing um, and the mastering. And so it was two years of just paying bills the mm-hmm. whole time. And um, in the darkest times of that, you know, it's just going, man, I, I got to finish this. It was really the idea that um, that there were going to be people out there whose lives were, were going to be positively affected by that. So when I go to a convention like that and I meet all these people that are just like, thank you so much for going the extra mile and giving us a uh, – you know, giving us a resource that uh, we would we could have never imagined that we were going to get. And uh, one of the most gratifying things for me is now they're actually using Survival Guide for the Modern Drummer at the University of North Texas, which is yeah, I'll take that. Yes, no, I tell you what, and it's a that thing will be around for thirty years. It's yeah. basically an update of Steve Houghton's Essential Styles, where you know Steve probably had the same group of guys that were very versatile musicians play all the Steve's styles. Steve's was really great, and yeah. I know we're we're going down a, a drum a, a nerd, nerd hole. drum nerd yeah. hole. So like, uh, you know, with with Steve's thing, it was he had great musicians. It was great execution, but it was a small amount of material. Right. When Tommy Igo did his, it was a l- much larger amount of material, but the um, the quality of the tracks uh, was not as high as what what it was with with Steve's. Mm-hmm. And the the thing that they both lacked was a true sense of diversity. Now Steve's book didn't suffer much from it; those were really great players. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me. The one thing that was missing out there was was trying to be really realistic with uh, and to make it uh, authentic and inspiring, no matter what kind of music that I was uh, playing. And that was difficult, and it took a lot of research, and it, and it even took a lot of help, uh, you know, and just even like enlisting my friend Lalo Davila from Middle Tennessee University to uh, just to help me with some of the world music styles, and you know. He was uh, he was really uh, helpful, and I, I thanked him again. I love that Lalo. Him. Yeah, yeah. And then my first book, um, song charting made easy, um, was uh, that was really inspired by like our journey to Nashville. You know, we come to Nashville, and um, both of us have degrees in music. Some of us have advanced degrees, like yourself. <laughs> um, so, and, and and the one thing we have in common there is that we both took you know, a lot of music theory. And the problem with music theory is they don't give you a lot of application for it. It's like, why am I harmonically analyzing Strauss right now? Exactly why am I doing this? Or figured and bass. From exactly. The, yeah. and, and those two things. And and it would be really interesting if people in universities would um, say, give me three semesters. And in the fourth semester, I'll show you how you can literally make money and apply music theory to your everyday musical life. Then I'd be like, oh, okay, you're doing a wax on, wax off thing. I get it. I want to do this. Um, So they don't do that. So cut to when we come to Nashville, I start getting handed Nashville number system charts, and I look at it and I go, that looks a lot like figured bass, only a little clearer. Yeah. And uh, it's Arabic numerals instead of Roman numerals. I learned that on the bandstand at a recording session. They hand it to me and they go, here you go, kid. And I'm like, what is this? And the keyboard player reads it. was like, every time you see a number, it's four beats. Just listen to the harmonic structure. Go by. Add any of the drum stuff you need to. It just outlines the whole song. You're going to love it. Yeah. That was my, yeah, yeah. it was like, I was making money trial learning. By, yeah. Trial by fire, man. So exactly. that's fantastic. So, um, <clears throat> so I, I got really uh, bought into the system. And um, I, uh, so it's a little bit of a long story, but I, I ended up doing, um, I ended up being featured in Modern Drummer. Right. Once I was featured in Modern Drummer, I think it was 2006 or something like that. Uh, then uh, Pasic asked me to, to do, to do their um, clinic, their, their thing. So yeah. I went there, I met the Modern Drummer guys, the guys from Modern Drummer magazine. My, my friend Dave Frangioni has just taken over. Uh, at Modern Drummer, he'd be a super interesting person for you to uh, interview. And yeah. I'm sure he'd be happy to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so at Modern Drummer, I was like, yeah, they knew who I was because they'd been looking at my picture in one of their recent uh, 
magazines, and I told them that I was interested in writing some articles for them. And the first two articles I wrote for them was a two-part series on on the Nashville number system. So from that, I ended up sending that to some publishers, and um, and one of them got back to me, and we ended up doing that book. And uh, Dave Black. No, no. See, that book is actually with Hal Leonard. Okay, gotcha. So that book is with Hal Leonard. Uh, the, the, they had a history with the um, the Nashville number system. They had actually uh, published the first book on it uh, by Neil Matthews Jr. Um, it's it's it starts off okay, and then it kind of veers off funky. And then you know, there's the other book that we we've all known. Jazz. And it gets the Chaz book gets it gets very guitar heavy really mm-hmm. fast. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to 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 find a way to make the Nashville number system really kind of like, I, it's almost like I should have wrote, just wrote Nashville number system for dummies. Maybe that would have been a better title. Um, I should have considered that. Uh, but, but don't you have to buy into their the I, dummies yeah, thing? Exactly. Yeah. But, but really that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to say if I could make it accessible to drummers, especially drummers that have limited harmonic uh, and melodic knowledge. Uh, and then, you know, just, just make it to the point where uh, drummers, bass players, guitar players, keyboard players can really easily understand the material, and um, and so that's that's what I tried to do. And um, it's uh, you know that one doesn't sell nearly as well as Survival Guide, but uh, it's uh, it, it's become really successful. And I've had I had a couple people come up to me at Basic, telling me, "Oh my God, your book was literally a lifesaver." So if you're a session musician of any kind. Uh, and you don't know what the Nashville number system is, uh, you definitely check that book out. It will. Um, I didn't have any anyone giving me any uh, like really cool quotes at the at the back of the book, so I did my own quote. I just said, and, I, and Rich I, loves I, it, and I believe it was the truth. <laughs> I said, uh, "Survival Guide for the." I mean, the uh, the uh, song charting made easy will. Uh, change the way you think about music. Sure. And the truth is the Nashville numbered system really does truly change the way you think about music for the better. It kind of gives you a helicopter view of the music. You can see kind of everything that's going to happen before it happens and uh, it kind of makes you a Nostradamus if you know that stuff. Nostradamus. Nice. I love that, buddy. No, it's a it, it, amazing resources. Congratulations on that. I know you're ha- helping a lot of folks and I know that every drum clinic I've done, which has been probably hundreds of drum clinics now at this point, I always say, buy the Jim Riley book. Buy the Jim Riley book. I appreciate Buy that. Buy the Jim Riley book. And so, and then I always mention, um, and tell you, reap what you sow, man, because I, you know, I mention. um, the drummer for Elton John all the time, you know, uh, what? <laughs> Nigel. Nigel. Awesome. And so John worked with for Nigel the other day, and I and and he said, Nigel, my buddy Rich, you know, he mentions you in every drum clinic because I always say, you know, you're only as good as the drummers that you know and that you've studied that you kind of soak up. So I said, if you want to learn how to play a ballad, check out Nigel Olson. If you want to learn how to play Greasy, check out this guy. If you want to learn how. And so he's always on that list, and and I got a drum head that John took the time. He said. Yeah, we'll we'll take care of it. It says, you know, you know, to Rich, you know, love you, keep on rocking, Nigel. So yeah. cool. I got one from Alex Van Halen in there. That's awesome. We just have such a great community. What do you want to know about uh, Jim Riley? Some little factoids. You have something you've always wanted to ask Jim Riley? Well, I've always been fascinated by your drum sets, especially the the firehouse one. Yeah, you know, and that big one that had the big monster gong. And uh, as you were talking about Craig earlier, um, I was thinking of a term. Uh, that what you kind of essentially did to him is that you portnoyed him. Yeah, I mean, I like to think of it as job. I like I like to think of it as job security. Uh, we want to make the drums as convoluted and difficult as possible, right. so that no one would ever want to set that stuff up. Yeah, you but know? I mean that that was a huge kit, and you know he probably looked at it going. Uh, my day just got longer. Oh my God. Yeah, you know, I think for him, you know, and, and when we speak to to to, to Tex, I think they just kind of it is, it, it, is. It, it does it doesn't really seem to phase them. It doesn't. It's not like they go, oh, four piece kit this year, joy, and ten piece kit this year, bummer, um, because they just kind of get into a flow. They're not going to get through their day any any quicker. They may get through the setup of the drums or the tuning a little quicker, but. Um, no, I, Craig is always excited to to do something new, and, and and over the last several years, I mean, it's it's definitely been a collaboration between the two of us. Yeah. When uh, this this year we did a uh, 
So I, I use what I would call, you know, more of an ergonomic setup where, in other words, if you picture like a double bass kit, like a Tommy Aldridge kit or a, or, or a Alex Van Halen kit, I'm always set up like that. In other mm-hmm. words, my snare drum is always centered instead of the bass drum being centered. So um, that's one of the reasons why the, the double bass drum kits are a more visually appealing option because when I, if I was to just play a five piece kit, usually I'm my right, my, my bass drum would be off center anyway. So what Mm -hmm. we did this year was we actually used one of those, uh, offset, you know, pedals Mm -hmm. and, uh, put the, the bass drum in the center and the, and the pedals come out to the side. So we had a bar over the bass drum, uh, that had to be custom made. And, uh, Kent Slutcher had done that with Luke Bryan And uh, so I got the number of the guy who custom made this bar. And now, finally, after after this year, uh, now Gibraltar is going to make that bar that we've been custom making. Yeah. Because uh, it, you know it it is a pretty cool look. But you know, the, with the with this drum set, I mean, Craig and I went in, and uh, you know, we I ordered the drums, and I was like, let's just build something cool out of it. Mm-hmm. And we didn't know exactly what it was going to look like. And then we, you know, we got, we got in there and, uh, I said, this is basically what I want to do. I said, I'll let you work it out. And I left and I <laughs> came back and he had it. And I was like, yep, this is about right. But the, the biggest kit that we ever did was the 2010 kit, which was, uh, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, uh, four octobons, 12 inch snare, regular snare, four bass drums Mm -hmm. so it was two 24s and the two 20s and the left 20 uh you know in classic you know alex van halen homage was a uh was a drink cooler so i had a hinge on it and you (laughs) opened it up and it was a drink cooler i love that um yeah were they connected by air vents and all that they were not connected by uh by air vents but it was uh pretty cool those also had uh some uh some firefighter logos and you asked me about that so my my dad's a retired firefighter oh, okay. uh, he was 30 Shit is awesome yeah, yeah he was 30 years on the job and uh so that was always kind of a an homage to him and to you know all the the firefighters that uh, seems like he put loves, their lives on the line yes yeah, oh, man seems like he loves his retirement he does he does he missed the dudes you know i mean i i think that um just like i think that's the biggest part of what we would miss if we weren't doing what we were doing anymore it's just that the camaraderie of all the the men and women that we get to we get to work with, mm-hmm. um, you know, that that's, that's a really special thing. And I think for him, that's some, that's part that he missed, but he is very good in retirement in terms of just, um, getting out there and just finding adventures. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter if I'm playing in Denver or I'm playing in Dublin, mm-hmm. he's going to show up. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's cool. I mean, that's just what he does. You know, he went to, I, I played it. I did a, a, a drum clinic in uh, Havana, Cuba last, last year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, legally. And, uh, <laughs> should have had you bring some cigars back. Yeah, yeah, and, man. um, and he, he went with me there. I mean, uh, you know, we, I had someone that was just talking to me about doing something down at uh, carnival in uh, mm-hmm. Brazil. And he's like, yeah, I, well, let me know. Cause I'm ready to go to that. We're, we're going. He's, he's, he's ready. He's, even if now, if I don't get it, he's still gonna be like, we're going anyways. <laughs> That's it. But yeah, he's always been when I, we'd always hear uh, stories of Greg Bissonette's father following him around. You know, yes. my, my dad is, uh, is definitely he's like Bud. Yeah. Yeah. He's Bud definitely Bissonette. that, that same way. Yeah. Uh, Bud Bissonette was uh, Greg's cartage guy in Los Angeles. He's like retired. He's like, Oh, I'll move your drums around. That's yeah. cool. You know, it's such a cool thing. Now, now my buddy Dave Frangioni owns that kit from Eat em and Smile, that Yamaha kit with all the exploded stuff on it. The one that was for sale. Was that the black and white one, the, the pearl one? I believe so. It's yeah, the, the one on, on the... That may have been the one after the one that the he's one that talking John, about. There's one on Reverb that tells you constantly one, pops up on my feed that's black and white kit from the David Lee Roth. No, no, this is one that looks like it's been hit with bombshells and yeah. it's okay. got pieces that are exploding. Yeah, that right. was I know very, which one you're talking yeah, about. I do. That one's for sale for $12,000. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean... And it's damaged. Okay, yeah. I mean, this kit is is pristine mm-hmm. and uh yeah it's just as i remember it so that that's one of those kits i was like yep i literally saw this kid in concert and there it is yeah <laughs> pretty cool <laughs> what did you learn i learned that um that you have to be open to the uh the things that life can throw you mm-hmm. and jim was very forward thinking and, and not constr- restricting himself he said you know what i'm going to be a touring drummer i'm going to be a recording drummer and i'm going to be an educator mm-hmm. and um 
I've done the same thing. And I think it's a great model, especially this was a model for us 20 years ago. It's still a good model to swim in those waters if you can. Absolutely. And as a result of staying on that path, you have ingrained yourself into the fabric of, of Nashville. And looking back, it's like so cool, man. It's just so awesome to, to just have done that with you man we're well, so that's just the first 20 years i know we got we're not dead yet <laughs> jim says you, you act like you got one foot in the grave i was like nah i just you know a little bit yeah yeah you're kind of it's like yeah you're, you're saying stuff that's like you know dude you got a lot of I, time i'm trying not to do that the because, business has changed so much yeah. since we've we've come here you know 20 something years ago when we came to nashville there was you know there was the session people there was the live people yeah and you know they weren't really the same thing and now <clears throat> You know, the, the business has changed so much. I mean, one, one thing that's become a big part of my whole business model, besides playing with Rascal Flats and the, the teaching that I do, is the uh, is recording from home. Sure. You know, I've done, I've recorded over 200 songs in the last two years alone, just because, uh, you know, I mean, there's, as you as you mentioned, there's there, there are clients out there that are they're looking uh for uh, for someone who is going to be thinking like a really musical drummer, yeah, yep. they could be in Newfoundland or Japan or South mm -hmm. America, and exactly. you're doing it from your basement, and that is a beautiful thing. What about yeah. you, Jim? What did you learn? I've learned that uh, Nashville was a lot smaller in 1999. Only ten clubs. It's a pretty amazing. It was not Much a lot. It was a, town. it was an amazing how many of those uh, storefronts, mm -hmm. especially the farther towards you got. Uh, towards uh, Third Avenue, Second Avenue, First Avenue, most of them were closed. And yeah. the other thing you should remember, Acme Feed and Seed was literally a feed and, and seed. seed. Yeah, and networking was absolutely absolutely necessary. And you went in with the understanding that hey, I got to meet the people who will make things happen. The artists, the next artists, absolutely. Artists. Yeah, the next artists. Yep. It, it, that's the one thing I think people are always looking for that big artist gig, <clears> and they're looking. And, I, and I'm not even going to mention any names. I will say one of the biggest artists in the world and a guitar player, and he was playing with that person, and he was complaining to me about how he didn't have a big gig and he wanted a big gig, and he complained so much and took for granted that situation that he ended up gone and that turned into literally one of the biggest acts in the entire world so sometimes the big gig that you have is is the little gig the gig the big gig you want is the little gig you have right yeah. now yeah and ride it out and play every gig like it's Madison Square Garden certainly that's what you guys did yeah and yep. i remember i remember doors opening on rascal flat shows and hi tom <laughs> we were doing, you know what I mean, and it was not because not not because you guys wanted to do that, it was just because the day was running late oh, or whatever, man. and then the doors are opening and doom, low tom. Doom. It was our production doom. was was really crazy Intense. that year. We had twenty trucks, so we had uh, you know they would have to put the stage together on one side, the lighting and video together on the other side, and they would take the stage and and push it under the uh, the lighting and video rigs. It was crazy. Intense. So right awesome. So JimReillyMusic.com? Yeah. Yeah, Jim, yeah JimReillyMusic.com. Make sure you guys check out Song Charting Made Easy, Survival Guide for the Modern Drummer. Uh, Jim has got his uh, Drum Dojo Weekends, and he's got yeah. his Drum Dojo Academy. That's right. Um, and and as, as far as with the Drum Dojo Weekends, uh, when does this uh, when does this appear into the world? Uh, probably in December. Yeah. Cool. Great. Uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, 2020, I will be uh, having... Uh, my uh 20th one of these drum dojo camps so wow. so if you're interested in that you know you can find me on all the social media stuff uh, especially you know instagram is really easy jim riley uh music. everything's jim riley music yeah, yeah. That's so smart yeah jim riley music.com i had such a good time how about just going down memory lane yeah, yeah yeah so good buddy thanks for being here man love you man really really love you that's Jim Riley. Follow him on the socials, jimreillymusic.com. As always, thank you to the School of Rock. And guys, spread the word about the show. And actually, if you're interested in getting us some other guests, you have some suggestions about the show, we have an email address, therichredmanshow at gmail.com. And uh, subscribe, share, rate, and review. We appreciate it. Keep coming back for the good stuff, and we'll see you next time. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.